This time on Follow Your Past, an adventurous only child is on a quest to solve the mystery of her family history. Oh, I've never heard of this guy. Facing down nature. Ah! I gotta be in my bonnet. Firing up a revolution. Woo! Hitting the open road. She'll discover relatives who built an American empire. Oh wait, you're not kidding. And a whole side of her family she's never met. There are a lot of family trees planted across the U.S. Yeah. And I'm here to shake them. Behind every American is an incredible story. My job is to dig deep and reveal the secrets of ordinary families with amazing tales to tell. Crazy. I'm Allison Stewart. This is follow your past. I'm in Wisconsin, and on my way to meet Cara Dwin Terrell. I'm taking her on a trip to learn how her innovative relatives created one of America's most famous brands, which became the hottest thing on the road. My name is Cara Dwin Terrell, and I'm from Portland, Oregon. I write books, and I also teach writing. I'm an adrenaline junkie. I love to be in the outdoors. Finding out about my family is really important to me because there's only my mother, my uncle, and me. And I'm married, but I don't have kids. The best thing I could find out is that I'm an heir to a wealthy estate. <laughs> Kira Dewin is traveling from Portland, Oregon to meet me in Wausau, Wisconsin. She has no idea what's in store. I'm here at a happy little farm, that's actually the name of the place, waiting for Kara Dewin so that we can follow her family's past. So this woman has a PhD, she climbs rocks and mountains, I'm gonna have my hands full, in a good way. I'm Allison. Hi, Allison. Nice to meet you. The thing about this journey is we don't just tell you about your family. You're going to get to walk in their footsteps. OK, sounds good. Our team of researchers have been looking into your family background for months. We found a connection to three brothers who have had a huge impact on history. Wow. I had no idea. <laughs> but before we reveal that story, we're going back almost 170 years. The reason we've brought you to Wisconsin is that this is where the first members of your family who came from Scotland settled. Oh my gosh. So I would like to introduce you to your third great-granduncle, James McLay. Wow, <laughs> I've never heard of this guy. You've never heard of the McLays? Never. <laughs> Uncle James arrived in the late 1840s and became a farmer. He was a little bit of an oddball, a bit of a grump. No children. Life in the frontier was hard work, but eccentric Uncle James had a vision for the future, and it was sweet. Your third great-granduncle, James McClay, became a beekeeper. A beekeeper? Wow, really? Yes. <laughs> He's a grump, a grumpy beekeeper. <laughs> Bob Bennis owns a happy little farm, and Bob knows bees and bee history. Bees are not indigenous to the United States, right? They came with the early settlers. The colonists first brought them over. The colonists relied on the busy bees to pollinate the crops imported from Europe. Honeybees spread so quickly, Native Americans called them the white man's flies. Halfway between the ice cream man and one of the <laughs> Ghostbusters. <laughs> when James first learned beekeeping, he'd hunt for wild bees living in a tree. Bob's showing us this abandoned hive called a bee gum, so we can see the real deal. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. That comb in there goes from the top there all the way down to the bottom. Oh, that feels neat. It's really kind of soft in places, a little squishy. But there was just one catch. When it came time to extract the honey. You had to smoke the bees out with sulfur, which killed them. To get the honey, you had to kill the creature that made the honey. Right, oh. right. But in 1851, a Pennsylvania minister invented a game changer for beekeepers, something that is still used today. Are you ready? <laughs> what? Ooh. Oh my gosh, look at those slots. Look how many they're in there. Oh. This is a movable frame hive the simple revolutionary tool that made it possible for James to harvest honey without killing off bees. 
The difference between a bee gum and modern beekeeping is movable frames. Oh. That is full of honey. Oh my gosh, that's all wow. honey in there? You can see. Look at that. Yeah, look at it glisten. Then we can get the honey out. Then we can take the empty frame and put it back in, and they will fill it back up. And you don't hurt the bees? We don't hurt the bees at all. Oh. Oh, I have a bee inside. Uh-oh. Inside? Yep. Oh, boy, she does. I got a bee in my bonnet, literally. Here. Okay. I'm not going to panic. Yeah. Don't panic. All right. I'm not going to panic. Yeah. Don't panic. All right, we got it. We got it. OK. It's all good. Right oh. on. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> You're my new hero. That was so chill. Are we at the point where we can get honey? You betcha. All right. So just start at the edge yep, there? Just... Care to win cuts off the beeswax, then spins out the honey with a hand-cranked extractor, like James would have used. Oh, it smells so good, too. It smells amazing. With this new invention, James could keep his hives humming year after year. Whoa, look <laughs> at it all down there. This advance made the commercial honey business possible. And as it turns out, bees make your breakfast, lunch, and dinner possible. It's so beautiful. Sorry, can't hold I know, right? <laughs> Mm. About a third of all crops grown in the U.S. today depend on bees to pollinate them. That's amazing. That sense of adventure that James McClay, my great, great, great grand uncle, seems to have had where he's just going to try things. I think, yeah, that sheds a little light for me. Look at that color. Well, remember we told you that he was a bit of a recluse and sort of an odd person? And grumpy sometimes? Occasionally grumpy, he was described. <laughs> but he was also someone who appreciated ingenuity and invention. And he invested in this incredible idea, a whole different thing, that went on to help change history. From his beekeeping money? Yes. <laughs> Am I going to find out what it is? Not right now. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited. I feel like I'm not going to sleep tonight, you know? Another day, another adventure. Today, I'm taking Kerdewin to Leona, Wisconsin to meet another relative who shared Uncle James's love for innovation. We're going to fast forward in your family's story about two generations to 1900. I don't know if you can see what I can see. You peek through the trees, can you see? Oh, wow. Steam! I see steam. Yes. That is the lumberjack steam train. Yeah, look at that. By the dawn of the 20th century, railroads were big business, employing millions of workers in America, including one of Kerdewin's relatives. James McLay, your great granduncle three times, he had a grandnephew whose name was Walter, your first cousin three times removed. Walter worked for the railroads, as did two generations before him. Hmm. And we brought you here so you could experience what it was like to work on the railroad like your relatives did back in the day. OK. As I'm walking toward the train, I'm thinking maybe my hands are going to get dirty. Kierdewin's cousin put America on the fast track. And she's about to find out how. Oh, my gosh. Kierdewin Terrell has no idea she's related to a trio of brothers who built a legendary American empire. Today, we are in Leona, Wisconsin. It was here in the Badger State back in the year 1902. Her cousin Walter helped change the way Americans travel. We brought you here so you could experience what it was like to work on the railroad like Walter did back in the day. OK, I'm ready. <laughs> I can do this. Hi, Pete. How are you? Pete Waiduki is an engineer on the Lumberjack Steam Train, which carried cargo and passengers between logging camps in the early 1900s. Wow, that's a great sound. <laughs> it's rhythmic. <laughs> You're used to that. He's like, who are these women? <laughs> in a railroad family, that sound was as soothing as a lullaby. Kierdewin's uncle Walter grew up with it. He was a gifted mechanic and tinkerer, the kind of guy who liked to reassemble his bike for fun. He became a railroad machinist. What did a machinist of that time actually do? 
They would have made the pins and the bushings for these rods and parts. And they had to be very precise so everything worked properly. Walter loved maintaining state-of-the-art locomotives. He was a talented machinist who worked in the railway company's machine shop. Taking care of the nuts and bolts of a train, that's a big responsibility. So I'm, I'm admiring the guy. I think he can handle shoveling some coal. I'm up there. Look at all that coal. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think it's roll up your sleeves time. Oh, yeah, I think so too, right? <laughs> all right, Pete, can you give us some instruction on what we're supposed to do? Step on that lever. Step on that lever. Oh. Whoa. When that furnace wow. door opens, it's a blast of heat. And you can feel that energy inside of that engine. Should we be a team? Yeah. Sure. Get a good shovel full here. All right. When this train is cold, it takes up to five hours to start. After that, the fire has to be stoked constantly. Oh, I got a good one here. All right, girl, here we go. Here we have quads of steel. <laughs> Doing this job. <laughs> Boy, that feels good. Shower. Yeah, I'm gonna, gonna take a shower. shower. <laughs> Just put me under the hose. <laughs> Let's head on down here. Walter made good money as a machinist, earning more than two dollars a day at a time when a loaf of bread cost five cents. But he decided to risk it all. Walter, he really had a passion project, something else he really wanted to do. We found his resignation letter from one of the railroads he worked for, and you can see it here. Oh my gosh. He resigned voluntarily to pursue this passion. It's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, it is. I admire that. You've got a family tradition of working on the railroad. It's gotta be something really drawing him that he just absolutely has to do. And that will be the next part of our story. Oh, wow. But first, a Wisconsin tradition, walleyes on the menu. Oh, that's beautiful. So how popular are fish fries? Fish fries is a staple for Wisconsin yeah. on Friday nights. Everybody has them, from the big restaurants to the little bitty bars. Mmm, that is delish. Mm -hmm. This is amazing, seriously. Tomorrow, Erdogan's going to find out how her relative went from riding the rails to ruling the open road. Kerwin Terrell is on a journey to discover how her relatives built an American empire. Today, we're headed to Catskill, New York, in the year 1908, to find out why her cousin Walter left a steady job for a shaky startup. Walter quit his job on the railroad. Okay. Because Walter loved motorcycles. Motorcycles? <laughs> By the start of the 20th century, automobiles were revving up to take over the road. Motorcycles were seen as little more than a fad, but Walter saw much bigger potential. Walter not only loved tinkering and playing with motorcycles, he also liked racing them. Wow. So on June 29th, 1908, right here in Catskill, New York, he entered the Federation of American Motorcyclists Endurance Run. Go Walter, following his dream. Uh, speaking of which, okay. <laughs> I want to go some motorcycles. <laughs> I got some friends. <laughs> oh, wait, you're not kidding. Oh! <laughs> awesome! You really didn't realize those were for you? No! I'm really psyched to get on the back of one of these beautiful bikes. That'd be amazing. Bill Nugent is the owner of Woodstock Harley-Davidson. He's mapped the race route Walter hoped to master back in the day. It wasn't about speed at that time. It really was about endurance, right? The motorcycle industry was less than 10 years old in 1908. 
question. So the big thing really was just to try to prove our bike is the best. Walter's race was the most strenuous test of motorcycles to date. 354 miles over two days. And his future depended on making it to the end. We're going to take a little bit on the ride of the route of that 1908 race. Okay. Up for it? I'm up for it. I'm kind of moving into the past. I'm sort of slipping back into Cousin Walter's era. This is the route Walter took. But in 1908, these nicely paved roads were rough dirt trails. Not too many people lasted, right? No, more than 60 riders started the first day. And by the time the, the first leg ended, 15 had already dropped out. Wow. Only half the riders finished. So to make it all the way to the end, you had to be pretty great. We do want to tell you that Walter turned out to be pretty great. <laughs> Not only did he make it to the end, he had a perfect score. And he was awarded the diamond medal. Wow. Walter didn't give up. Where other people dropped out, he kept pushing himself. And I really relate to that. We've come to the end of the road for today. Woo! That's a good day. Woo! But I've saved something special for care to win. Would you like to see what Walter looked like? I would love to see when what he raced. Walter. I've been trying to imagine. These are what the bikes look like on race day. Oh my gosh. And that is Walter. Whoa. Your first cousin, three times removed. Check him out. Oh my gosh. There he is. Growing up with a single mom, so it was just my mom and I. It feels like our family's really, really small. Oh and there's his bike. That's really powerful feeling that I have relatives that I'm reaching out and touching in the past. But Kerdewin's past is about to become her future. We're headed toward a surprise introduction to the family she never knew existed. Wow, hello. <laughs>
Hey, John. This is the author of a book on the history of Harley Davidson. How are you doing? Hey, nice to meet you. <laughs> nice wow. To meet you. Over 250 different companies attempted to make motorcycles in this country. Yeah. And Harley Davidson's the only American brand that lasted that entire time. So something you should be proud of. That's <laughs> incredible. Yeah. So John's got awesome pictures. Oh my gosh. And here's my great grandfather Walter right there. Oh my gosh. So if you haven't figured it out by now, Right. You guys are cousins. <laughs> oh my god, that's <laughs> such a trip. <laughs> this is crazy. I'm standing next to a family member I, I don't even know. I've never met in my life. Never heard about even. I mean, that's incredible. This is Jean Davidson, my dear mother, on her first motorcycle ride. And you know, mom? <laughs> Would you like to meet? Whoa. <laughs> Would you like to be so Walter's so granddaughter? Wow. Hello. <laughs> Oh, it's so nice to meet you. <laughs> John is Carterwin's fourth cousin, and Jean is her third cousin once removed. Wow, that's so cool. Oh my god, that person looks like me. Oh my god. <laughs> well, we I can tell you're kind of excited. That is really, really exciting. The oh family resemblance is just uncanny. It's really kind of magical, and I'm, I'm getting a little bit emotional. I mean, it's really lovely. Oh, my God. The family just expanded, it my just friend. <laughs> I know. Growing up was just my mom, this, you know, single mom, and it was just her and I, and that's it. And, you know, and my family's just always felt so tiny. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Our family is bigger than we thought. It's a lot bigger than we thought. Thank what you pleasure. so much. Thank you. Today is the official last day of this journey. <laughs> But it feels like it's the beginning of something else. It's the opening up of doors that I didn't even know were there to open.